Veuillez vous asseoir. The court is now back in session. L'audience est reprise. The international co-prosecutor, you may now continue. Et la parole with est au co-procureur. Statement. Ces brèves déclarations liminaires. Thank you, Mr. President. Before the break, Je vous remercie, Monsieur le I indicated that I would set out briefly the roles of each of the three accused in relation to the arrest, detention, interrogation and execution of perceived enemies. First of all, dealing with Yang Sari. Yang Sari, as Minister of Foreign Affairs, was responsible for identifying enemies within that organization and determining the ministry cadres who would be sent to work sites for temporary and those who would be arrested and sent to S21. Et ceux qui seraient arrêtés, envoyés S21. His participation in these matters will be proven by both witness testimony de and documentary et des éléments de documentaire prouveront sa participation. As S21 Chairman Doik has explained, le each organization head was involved when cadre from their organization were implicated as potential traitors in confessions obtained by S21 interrogators. Doik would first send such confessions to Son Sen or Nguyen Chia, and they would forward a copy of the confession or list of the implicated cadre to the relevant organization heads. A joint decision on the persons to be arrested would then be made by Nguyen Chia, Son Sen and the Standing Committee together with the respective organization head. Pursuant to this standing operating procedure, confessions that implicated Ministry of Foreign Affairs cadre, former diplomats, or other persons that fell under Yang Seri's responsibility, such as returning intellectuals, were routinely sent to Yang Seri for his review and advice. Yang Seri's receipt of S21 confessions has been confirmed by trial Le witness TCW564. This testimony is corroborated by a number of S21 confessions that contain handwritten annotations indicating they were sent to Comrade Van, Yang Seri's alias, alias, such as this confession Comme of the exemple, former DK ambassador, ambassador to Laos, Mir Tuch. He entered S21 on 20 November 1977 and was executed four months later on 31st March 1978. Other former cadre from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs will also implicate Yang Seri in this process. The Chamber will hear from at least two such witnesses who were accused of being traitors and directed by Yang Seri to write biographies. The biography of one of those cadre Trial witness TCW 724 starts with the statement, our comrade in charge has reported that our class enemy has brought accusations on me. The co-prosecutors will offer into evidence a copy of that biography as tangible evidence 
of Yang Seri's participation in matters that determined life or death of his cadre. You will also hear how, in a few select cases, Yang Seri protected members of his staff from arrest. Yang Seri a protégé des membres de son personnel. Persons who were his friends or whom he had known since his days as a student in France. If you accept that Yang Seri tried to save lives, that is a matter for which he should be given credit. But ultimately, the real significance of this evidence is that it proves that Yang Seri did have authority and the power to control who could be arrested and who would not be arrested. This fact removes any doubt that he bears criminal responsibility for the 200 other former employees, diplomats, returning intellectuals and family members who were arrested and smashed at S21. <coughs> Yang Seri's implementation of the CPK enemy policy at his ministry also included political education meetings where he instructed his cadre that internal purges were needed because secret agents of the enemy were inside and monthly lifestyle meetings and self-criticism sessions that he led and which were used to identify suspect cadre within the ministry. An internal document from September 1977 ministry conference notes that they had smashed and swept cleanly away the enemies who were CIA, KGB, and Yuan territory swallows, and calls for continued efforts to sweep cleanly away the remaining enemies within the ministry. Your Honours will also hear how Yang Seri's responsibility extended to suspect cadres from the, throughout the country who were reassigned to work at the foreign ministry as a way station en route to S21. Yang Seri has admitted that he was aware the ministry was used as a holding centre for suspect cadres. Because of this role, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was called the anti-chamber of death by one former cadre. And as you will hear from Doig, this practice was sufficiently prevalent that Nguyen Chia used the expression to be sent as a diplomat to signify the arrest and execution of a cadre. Yang Seri's knowledge of arrests and execution is also reflected in a number of other statements. For example, during a speech for members of the diplomatic community on 17 April 1977, he announced that the Cambodian people and revolutionary army had smashed all the enemy's tricks and crushed their spy network. Leur réseau and in an April 1978 interview with a representative Dans of the US communist movement, Yang Seri described how Vietnamese and KGB agents in Phnom Penh had been arrested in April and September 1976, who were plotting to organize a coup d'etat against us, and how CIA agents disguised as revolutionaries had been arrested in 1977. Your Honours, you will also hear how the CPK's highest representative to the international community would repeatedly defend and deny the killings 
and mass human rights abuses when they were directly brought to his attention through official international meetings and official correspondence. One of those reports issued on the 14th of August 1978, pursuant to the 31st session of the Human Rights Council Subcommission on the Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities of the United Nations, of course, contained a request from the Canadian government for the Human Rights Council to investigate crimes occurring in Cambodia. They, the Canadians, said, I quote, since the Khmer Rouge took absolute control of Cambodia, called today the Democratic Republic of Kampuchea. The entire world has been horrified on learning from many concurrent sources about the terrible genocide committed on two million babies, children, women, and men, about the deportation of all living souls from the capital of Phnom Penh and every other city, with no exception made for dying persons confined to hospitals, and about the fact that the government, calling itself the Communist Party of Democratic Kampuchea, has used children to shoot those who were executed. For these reasons, all members of the Canadian Parliament, Canadian Parliament express their horror at horror that genocide, genocide, which is one of the worst crimes in the history of mankind, and urge the, the government of democratic Kampuchea to stop that inconceivable bloodbath. And the Prime Minister, Pol Pot, et le to accede Pot immediately to the resolutions à la résolution voted voté with the support of Canada, Canada on March 8, 1978, at the fifth session of the United Nations Commission on Human Rights, sitting in Geneva, Lors and finally asked all Unies parliamentarians de de and governments et enfin which maintain rela relations with our country to protest against, against that slaughter which has astounded the entire world. In response, a month after this report was en produced, réponse, on 16 rapport, September 1978, Yang Seri sent an official telegram Yang stating, un telegram I quote, je cite, We reject the subcommission decision nous as impudent de la interference comme une in internal affairs of Democratic Kampuchea. By that decision, subcommission supports the activities Avec cette décision, of traitors to their country and the maneuvers de pays, of American imperialists, imperialists and their partisans who, after committing immeasurable crimes against the people of Kampuchea, more Kampuchea, than a million inhabitants of Kampuchea, and destroying 80% of Kampuchea, continue to defame Kampuchea, democratic Kampuchea de to whitewash their crimes. As in the past, people and government passé, of democratic Kampuchea will make mincemeat of any criminal maneuvers of the imperialists and their partisans. They will not tolerate any affront to the sovereignty of Kampuchea. End of quote. Fin de la citation. Earlier, on 13 June, 1978, Yang Seri responded to similar damning reports tabled at the 31st session of the Human Rights Council of the United Nations regarding human rights abuses in Cambodia. In a note which Yang Seri sent 
to the United Nations Secretary General, which was disseminated to the UN and all member states, he stated, I quote, the propaganda machine of the imperialist, expansionist and annexationist has raised what it calls the human rights issue in its slander and denigration of democratic Campuchia. The infamous calumny against the people of Campuchia is no new development and did not take by surprise the people and government of democratic Campuchia. Your Honours, by this and many other statements made by Yang Sari to the international community during the period of democratic Campuchia, it is clear that he was well aware of the crimes that were being committed in this country. Next, I will move on to specifically address Q Sampon. While virtually every other person who lived in democratic Campuchia was aware of the constant arrest and disappearance of people around them. Q. Sampon has claimed in his statement to the co-investigating judges that he was not aware of any arrests during the democratic Campuchia period and only learned of such matters after January 1979. This, your honours, is a falsehood and it defies belief and it's refuted by overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Much of that evidence I have already discussed. There are minutes of the 8 March 1976 Standing Committee meeting that record Q. Sun Pan's presence for a discussion regarding arrests of enemies in the north zone and the measures to be taken against those persons. There are numerous telegrams and reports that were sent to Q. Sun Pan at Office 870 describing arrests interrogations and executions. But there is more. Q. Sampan has admitted that he and Suevasi, alias Dun, were the sole members of the political office of 870, also called the Office 870 Committee. Like Q. Sampan, Dun was a regular attendee at standing committee meetings. Their offices, responsibility, included monitoring the implementation of CPK policy and the distribution of goods and supplies to DK organizations throughout the country. The Central Committee's 30th March 1976 decision also delegated to this Central Office Committee the authority to smash people surrounding the Centre Office. While Doon was the original chairman of this office, he was arrested in late 1976 or early 1977, leaving Q. Sampon in sole control. Your Honours, it is absolutely inconceivable that Q. Sampon was not aware of the arrest and execution of his office mate. When asked by the co-investigating judges to account for Dun's disappearance, during the final two years of the DK regime, the only explanation Q. Sampan could offer was that Dun travelled quite a lot. And while Q. Sampan suggests that Dun's replacement may have been a senior cadre named Chim Sam Oak, alias Pang, the evidence shows that Pang himself was arrested and killed at S21 as part of the internal purges ordered by the party centre. Your Honours, not only was Q. Sampan aware of these arrests, 
but a witness has described how he informed Cadre during a political indoctrination session that Pang had been arrested for being a Vietnamese spy. Upon Dun's removal, Q. Sampan assumed a supervisory role in relation to the Ministry of Commerce, an organization that was severely purged, with hundreds of cadres sent to S21. Q. Sampan's involvement and knowledge of such arrests is beyond doubt. You will see evidence of his active supervision of the Ministry of Commerce and his regular visits to ministry sites. A Ministry of Commerce cadre who worked at the Tul Tompong warehouse in Phnom Penh has stated that in January 1979, Q. Sampan, Nguyen Chia, and Minister of Commerce Van Rit came to his warehouse and announced the cessation of calls for study sessions, which were known by all to be the primary method by which cadre were called away for arrest. As evidence of Q. Sampan's active involvement in the implementation of CPK enemy policies. The Chamber will also hear evidence from trial witness TCW 428, who will describe being instructed to report directly to Q. Sampan regarding the security situation in his sector, including arrests and imprisonment of enemies. On one occasion, that witness informed Q. Sampan that his brother and sister-in-law had been arrested and detained at the North Zone Security Office. Q. Sampan not only had knowledge of the arrests, but also of his own relatives. He also had the power and authority to intervene and procure their release. Q. Sampan publicly endorsed and disseminated the CPK's enemy policy on numerous occasions. As early as September 1976, at the Conference of Non-Aligned Countries in Colombo, when questioned by a journalist regarding the evidence of deaths of hundreds of thousands of people in Cambodia, he confirmed the execution of traitors, adding, it's incredible how concerned you Westerners are about war crimes. In a 1980 interview, Q. Sampan expressed his full support for the decision to purge members of the Standing Committee and the Central Committee, stating that there were Khmer people who were Yuan undercover agents in our authority lines and held important positions, adding that they had dealt with those people completely in 1977 and 1978. And in a 1977 speech to a mass rally celebrating the second anniversary of the 17 April victory, Q. Sampan implored the listeners to continue. I quote, resolutely suppressing all categories of enemies, preventing them from committing aggression, interference or subversion against us. We must wipe out the enemy in our capacities as masters of the situation. Everything must be done neatly and thoroughly. We must wipe out the enemy insisted Q. Sampan, neatly and thoroughly. Like his fellow party leaders, he saw those enemies everywhere, even amongst long-time friends like Hu Nim, who only a few days earlier had been sent to S21 as a traitor. Next, I will address Nguyen Chia. Nguyen Chia's 
participation, la participation in the arrests de Nietzsche and executions of enemies is also established beyond any question from an abundance of evidence that will be presented to this chamber. As the CPK leader responsible for party affairs, Nguyen Chia was directly involved in the discipline and purges of party cadres. As a member of the party's military committee, he was involved in security issues throughout the country. The role played le rôle joué by Nguyen Chia at S21 will be central to this case. Ying Tirit has made clear in statements to this court who she considered responsible for the torture and execution of students from her ministry. To Cambodia. So I had nothing to do with Nguyen Chia, Je although I knew he, what he has done, and I knew he killed people, I, I, I know this, I, I know this, uh, I, I know how many people died and who killed those people, I am knowledgeable, so the students who came with me, uh, they are university graduates from Russia, from Moscow, uh, from de Russie, uh, Prague, de Moscou, de Prague. Les personnes donc qui avaient fait des études de France. Pays, de so France. when I came, they came uh, uh, with me and stayed, uh, uh, lived in Phnom Penh with me. And uh, at the beginning of everything, when my uh, students were arrested and executed, it was done by Nunchia, and they uh, uh, took them in a truck and, ils ont été and executed. En camion et exécuté. And just to be clear, this statement, Your Honours, was made in February 2009, eight months later. Uh, she was declared fit by the two experts, Dr. Brinded and Dr. Carl. Nguyen Chia's role at S21 will be testified to in depth by its former chairman, Doik. He will describe orders provided by Nguyen Chia relating to arrests, interrogations and executions at S21. Specific orders from Nguyen Chia that Doik recalls include the mass execution of 300 prisoners from the east, the execution of fellow standing committee member Von Vett, and the execution of a group of foreigners held at S21, whom Nguyen Chia ordered to be burned to death using car tires. Doik operated pursuant to a general order that all persons sent to S21 were to be killed after they had been interrogated and confessed. Doik will also testify as to how Nguyen Chia became the immediate superior to whom he reported in the latter part of 1977, after Son Sen had been assigned to the battlefield in the escalating military conflict with Vietnam. From that date until the end of the DK regime, Doik would meet with Nguyen Chia every three to five days to report on S21 operations and receive orders. Doik has described how the most significant function of S21 was to provide confessions to the Standing Committee, which were then used to make decisions on the arrests of persons implicated in those documents. Doik will testify that he would send such confessions to Nguyen Chia who in turn would forward them to the heads of the organization of the implicated cadres, after which a joint decision would be made on who was to be arrested.
Doik's testimony regarding these procedures will be corroborated by the testimony of other witnesses, as well as by the confessions themselves. Trial witness TCW 617 has confirmed to the co-investigating judges that he came to Doik's house to receive S21 confessions and would then deliver those documents to Nunche. The co-prosecutors will introduce into evidence a total of over 50 confessions that contain an annotation by Sonsen or Doik indicating that the document had been sent to Nuenchia or that contained Nuenchia's handwriting. As you will hear in the following video clip, the accused himself has admitted receiving so many confessions that he was unable to read them all. ពីមានសាកមុតអំតៃតាអានអរបាយការសិក្ដីសារភាពហ្នឹងបាទរបស់សំពីមួយដើម្បីយល់ហ្នឹង <coughs> <coughs> ពីពលចរណ៍ពេកហើយមិនមែនជាភេរកិច្ចរបស់ខ្ញុំមើលណាតែការ <coughs> 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 Your Honours will also see on the cover pages of the confessions to which I have referred annotations reflecting how copies were sent to the heads of the organisations of the cadre who had been implicated in the confession. Those annotations will show such confessions being sent to zones, sectors, military divisions and ministries throughout the country. And you will hear testimony from a number of the regional cadre who confirm that they received confessions from the party centre and that they were used to arrest local cadre in their areas. Nuenchia's knowledge and intent relating to the CPK enemy policy is evidenced by many statements he's made during and since the DK period. For example, in a July 1978 speech to a visiting delegation from the Communist Party of Denmark, Nuenchia revealed the efforts of the CPK leaders to deal with internal enemies. And I quote, since liberation, our experience relates to anti-party activities organized inside our party. They usually involve CIA, Vietnamese and KGB agents. Our experiences in this area are very recent, but it appears from what we've been able to learn that CIA, Vietnamese and KGB agents have been working inside the party for a long time. 
Although we say plans have been crushed, we do not mean the enemy has given up. We have to continue to build and to defend our path and our leadership at, and to apprehend the people who have infiltrated our party. In a 2005 interview, Nguyen Chia stated that, I quote, we killed only the bad people, end quote, and that the reason the purges started was that some of the people in charge of districts and provinces were our enemies. These traitors didn't follow our policies. Many former comrades of yours, senior members of the party, were purged and lost their lives. Not many. Some didn't admit their mistakes. But others knew, and they admitted them in our meetings, and they were accepted. We didn't kill many. We killed only the bad people, not the good. And at his initial appearance before this court, Nguyen Chia stated that there were American CIA and Soviet KGB agents, the Free Khmer and Vietnamese secret agents who were hiding within the party, among the population and in our cooperatives. And it, it was these persons that caused the party line to be raw and burnt and then destroyed the country party and people. Thus, Your Honours, you can see that each of the accused played an integral role in the misguided and tragic policy of the CPK towards perceived enemies that resulted in the execution of hundreds of thousands of Cambodians, and, th and this, of course, is the principal reason that this court was formed and why we are here today. If I could now move to the next policy, policy number four within the joint criminal enterprise, targeting of the Cham, Vietnamese and Buddhist. At the beginning of 1975, Your Honours, Cambodian society was complex and culturally rich and diverse. According to the CPK analysis, Cambodia was comprised of different classes of people, including feudalists, bourgeoisie, capitalists, civil servants, Buddhist monks, intellectuals such as teachers and students, Lonnol military officers and soldiers, workers, rich peasants, middle peasants, poor peasants, and national minorities such as the hill tribes, Lao, Thai, Chinese, Chams, and Vietnamese. The accused decided that they would bring this rich diversity to a sudden end. Their perfect, pure society would have only one kind of person, the worker peasant. The CPK's initial policies on religion and ethnic minorities were developed by the accused and other senior party leaders in intensive meetings held following their arrival in Phnom Penh in April and May 1975 at locations such as the railway station and the Prayer Kev Temple, also known as the Silver Pagoda. Nguyen Chia, Yang Seri and Q Sampon were each present for those policy meetings, with Nguyen Chia serving as the leader of the discussion groups. As Madam Chia Liang stated yesterday, the decisions made by the accused at those meetings were communicated to zone, sector, district and military leaders from throughout the country at a mass meeting 
that started on the 20th of May 1975 and continued for six days. Pol Pot and Nguyen Chia presented the party policies that were to be implemented. Nguyen Chia doing most of the presentations. In addition to the policies on cooperatives and enemies that I've already discussed, the CPK leaders provided specific instructions both on religion and the treatment of the minorities in this country. With respect to the Buddhist religion, Pol Pot and Nguyen Chia instructed the party cadre that they were to close all pagodas and defrock all monks. They stated that monks were a special class that were to be wiped out and that what would not be allowed. Following the meeting, district and sector secretaries returned to their respective regions and informed local cadre and monks of the party policy requiring the monks to disrobe and leave their pagodas. Your Honours, those monks who refused were killed. Buddhism was reviewed by CPK leaders as archaic superstition contrary to party ideology and policies. The CPK branded Buddhist monks as leeches, blood-sucking parasitic worms, and feudalists who sucked the blood of the people, and to ensure that there was no doubt that Buddhism was to be eradicated from Cambodia, the CPK leaders converted temples, places of peace, and worship and contemplation to security offices used for torture and execution. For many centuries, Buddhism has been the foundation of Cambodian society, providing everything from the ethical rules by which the Cambodian people live together with the temples at which they gather for religious and family celebration. As you've heard from my colleague, the CPK leaders destroyed this unifying thread in Khmer culture, yet another victim of their program to erase and eliminate the old society. At the 20th to the 25th May, 1975 mass meeting, the party leaders also provided instruction on the treatment of ethnic minorities. CPK cadre were instructed that all Vietnamese were to be deported, including Vietnamese wives of Khmer husbands. As a direct result, of this directive from the CPK leaders, an estimated 150,000 to 200,000 Vietnamese were deported from Cambodia by September 1975. Also, at the May 1975 or later meetings, Pol Pot told the cadre that the Cham were to be barred from their religion forced to raise pigs and eat pork, and that anyone who resisted was to be killed. You have already heard from Madame Chi Liang regarding the horrific crimes that ensued against the Cham and Vietnamese during the DK period, and the evidence that this was part of a systematic plan of genocide formed by the CPK leaders. Incitement 
used by the party leaders in issues in 1978, issues of revolutionary flag, to direct the elimination of the re remaining Vietnamese in the country, commending the quick burning flames of national and class hatred that had been transformed into a great mass movement, to smash and sweep cleanly away Yuan enemies who stink to high heaven uh, and are degradingly uh, despised as nothing. Et, uh, plus que tout. I will add some further remarks here regarding these crimes of genocide. De genocide. First, I would direct Your Honour's attention uh, to two contemporaneous two documents, documents de from the DK period that prove beyond any doubt that it was the party centre leaders who controlled and directed the actions taken against the Cham and Vietnamese groups. First is the 30 November 1975 telegram sent by the Secretary of the East Zone to Pol Pot, Pol Pot copied to Nguyen Chia regarding the removal of 50,000 Cham from the East Zone. zone est. It specifically references the instructions of the organization that had been provided at a previous meeting. Let me quote, je cite, the view decided at the meeting stipulated that Islamic brothers and sisters were not to be sent into Crouche, whereas the Northwest and the North had to accept in order to split up Islamic people and separate them from the length of the Mekong River so as to ameliorate the atmosphere some. In principle, their en removal principe, was to break them up in accordance with your views in your discussions with us already. End quote. Similarly, in this 17 May 1978 report to Office 870, the Secretary of the North West Zone asks what Ankar 870 has decided to do with Yuan elements who have Cambodian husbands, the Cambodians who have Yuan wives, and the mixed race Yuan children. You heard earlier today about the implementation of a specific CPK policy in Sveiriang and Preveng provinces in relation to the ex executions of ethnically mixed families. Also, in 1978, the CPK leaders began to incite RAK troops with a 30 against one slogan. At first, this policy was disseminated in private directly to RAK soldiers. Then the CPK began to broadcast it publicly on their national radio station. The following is a quote from one of those broadcasts, and I quote, in terms of numbers, one of us had to kill 30 Vietnamese. For this reason, two million troops should be more than enough to fight the Vietnamese because Vietnam only has 50 million inhabitants. We do not need 8 million people. We need only 2 million troops to crush 50 million Vietnamese." End quote. Simply put, your honours, that statement was a public declaration of the CPK plan to exterminate all the Vietnamese people. Q Sam Pon also used his speeches to incite genocide against the Vietnamese, describing them as ruthless, savage, internationalized enemies and calling for national hatred. Some have questioned whether the mass executions of the Vietnamese and Cham communities were genocide or part of the broader plan of the CPK leaders to eliminate all enemies. The answer, Your Honours, is that they were both. 
un peu des For example, ainsi, the mass execution of the remaining Cham people in Kangmis district in 1977 occurred as part of the purge of the entire central zone by CPK forces from the southwest. The following year, when southwest forces moved on to purge and cleanse the east zone of its enemies, the Cham people in Krokchma district were subject to mass killings. Central zone cadre have described how those executions were carried out in part by a special intervention unit of the party center under the command of standing committee member Son Sen. But there can be no question that during these purges, the Cham were not treated the same as other potential enemies. The CPK did not check biographies of the Cham to determine if they were part of the wrong class. They did not limit their arrests to Cham who had been implicated as possible traitors in confessions of others. When Cham were arrested, they were not subject to interrogation to determine whether they were enemies of the CPK or to uncover networks of traitors with whom they associated. The Cham, all of them, were simply rounded up taken to sites like Wat Ultral Kung and immediately executed because the directive from the CPK leaders was that if you were Cham, you were an enemy. Full stop. When you hear the testimony of the survivors and other witnesses, there will be no question. This was genocide. The last policy Policy number five was the regulation of marriage. La dernière politique, la réglementation the assault du était la of the CPK leaders upon the personal dignity and freedom of Cambodians went so far as to include the power to decide who would marry whom. De a woman qui. named Tuk Sithan was a pharmacy manager for the Sithan. Ministry of Social Affairs. The Deputy Minister of Social Affairs, Sin Fal Kung, alias Su, directed that Sithan would marry a man named Pen Vasat. Sithan did not want to marry Vasai, but Yang Tirit pushed her into doing it. Sithan tried her best to make the marriage work, and soon came to love her husband. Then, in late March 1978, Nguyen Chia called for the arrest of Sithan's husband. Yang Tirit agreed with Nguyen Chia that he was an enemy and should be taken away. Two weeks later, Yang Tirit summoned Sithan and read to her from Vasai's S21 confession. When Sithan protested, that she did not believe the accusations against her husband, Ying Tirit responded angrily, asking her, don't you trust Ankar? This was the impossible dilemma presented again and again to Cambodians in the CPK's utopian nightmare. Who do you trust? Your loved one or the party? The wrong answer to that question was invariably fatal. The photograph that you see in front of you on the screen now is of a young woman named Hood Bopana. This photograph has come to exemplify around the world the human pity of the victims of the Khmer Rouge. Bopana was executed at S21. The acclaimed Cambodian filmmaker Riti Pan made a film about her story entitled Bopana, a Cambodian Tragedy. That film now shows 
twice daily at the Tall Slang Museum. Par jour au musée de the renowned journalist Elizabeth Becker has also written a book about Bopana entitled Finding Bopana. What was the treasonous act committed by Bopana for which she was interrogated and tortured for months at S21 and then bludgeoned to death by CPK cards? Your Honour, Bopana's crime was to fall in love le crime without de receiving était de the permission tomber en amour of the accused. Sans avoir reçu la permission For the CPK, love that was unauthorized by Ankar was a waste of time par and a betrayal de temps, of the mandatory love for the party, and it was punishable by death. Pour le parti, un acte qui était Your Honours heard yesterday from Madame Chia Liang about forced marriage during the DK regime. Chien, it is plain from the systematic implementation of forced marriages by CPK cadres in all DK organizations in every part of the country that this was a policy centrally directed by the accused and other CPK leaders. This will also be proven, to your honours, by witness testimony Cela and documentary evidence. Par des dépositions de témoins et des éléments de preuve documentaires. My concluding remarks, your honour. Your honours, this court was principally established to bring some small measure of justice many years on to the victims of the Khmer Rouge. But I would also ask you respectfully, Mais je vous to see your role here in a much wider context. The 20th century was one of the bloodiest in the Book of Years. A été un des plus sanglants. Over 150 men, women and children perished across the globe. Millions de Most of et de these victims of war and terror remain unvindicated. La plupart de ces victimes but de here, et de terreur, in Cambodia, a unique conclusion. opportunity has been given Toutefois, to address Cambodge, this issue of impunity, impunity 30 years on, de régler cette question de to set a powerful example, and to send a puissant. strong warning from the past to the future so that human beings everywhere can rightfully expect to live in peace under the law. Moreover, that this trial is a reaffirmation of our absolute refusal as human beings to accept the cynical inevitability of destroying each other from age to age. This court is by no means a perfect institution. Ce tribunal pas it has struggled parfaite. under its own burdens. But it is the only instrument we have to address crimes of shocking magnitude that threaten the fragile bonds that unite all of humanity. In seeking to apply the sanctions of the law to these three men, we do not dispute that states and individuals outside Cambodia contributed to what took place here, both before and during those fateful years of 1975 to 1979. But that does not exonerate these three accused before you. It is not a defense for what they did. Just east of Siem Reap town, in Rulus commune, Dans of la commune Prasad de Rulos, Bakong district. district de a new Bakong. institution of higher learning is rising from the mud on the shores of the Great Lake. Dans la boue. Classrooms, dormitories, Au rive du Grand Lac. a meeting hall, des de classe, des library, des computer de centre are all under construction and will soon give poor children in Siem Reap, the education Reap, they need, ils ont affording them the opportunities leur that we all deserve as human beings. Que nous, comme êtres humains, tous. This place, 
Bakong Technical College, college technique de Bakong is the vision of a man la vision homme named Ranachic Yemsut, Ronnie to many of his friends. Plusieurs de ses amis le connaissent sous le nom Yemsut de has a particular attachment to CM Reap. Yemsut a un attachment particulier On the 31st of December 1977, his entire extended family, toute sa famille men, énergie, women, des hommes, children, des femmes, des grandparents, des grandparents, aunts, des tantes, uncles, des oncles, and cousins, ses cousins was among a group of 79 new people who were herded to the shore of the Great Lake by CPK cadres and clubbed to death in a muddy ditch in one of the countless massacres during the DK regime. Yimsut was the only survivor of that massacre. And today, on those same shores, he's building what would be a university. A place of learning, un something decent, quelque chose and de honorable, décent, and lasting. Et de durable. Between 1.7 million and 2.2 million human beings died premature deaths in the three years, eight months, and 20 ans, days that mois, these three accused ruled Cambodia. The magnitude of lost human spirit, talent and potential. De Scholars, doctors, builders, humains. surgeons, teachers, des des docteurs, men and women of commerce, creators, religious and civic leaders. Des hommes et des femmes du commerce, This endless des role of the dead. Civique, cette longue How many de schools, universities and hospitals are unbuilt? Et pas How many construit. lives have not been saved? De pas How many sauvé? children not educated? Pas How été much instruit? has been lost. It does not escape the, en the sight of anyone who lives in this country how it still struggles today. And why? Because the accused who are before you are thieves of time and common murderers of an entire generation of Cambodians. They robbed decades of development and prosperity from this country. De de they left gaping holes in every Cambodian family. They removed all Cambodge. breath from notions such as law and civilized behavior. No one in this country is left unhurt or unaffected by what these three elderly men have done. Mr. President, your honors, Monsieur le Président, Your judgment Madame, juges, must be inscribed as a decisive act in the history of this country and the mandate of this court. Ce ce the evils that these three men set in motion must be determined. Sur les mis en par ces trois the trois. office of the co-prosecutors is absolutely confident that the guilt of each will be proven beyond reasonable doubt. De eux sera the en need for justice of two million people will be satisfied, and their satisfied. suffering and death will not have been useless to the progress of mankind. Pour le progrès de Thank you, Mr. President. Merci Thank you, Your Honours. De votre attention. The President, I thank you, Mr. Co-Prosecutor. Merci, uh, Monsieur le Counsel for the Civil Party, you may now proceed. La parole Counsel Vic Mr. President, Maître Your Honours, I have Président, two points Madame, uh, to juges. make at this moment. First, uh, we would like uh, the President to clarify to us tout que le Président when the lead lawyer for the civil party is allowed to introduce the three foreign lawyers so that they can be recognized before this chamber and so that they can enjoy their full rights as counsel. And number two, with regard to the opening 
opening statement, it is really the best opportunity for the civil parties and other victims of the regime. And uh, for this, uh, we refer to the internal rules of the ECCC uh, that victims and civil parties are allowed to participate in the proceedings. Unfortunately, uh, they are not allowed to make any comments or observations uh, during this uh, hearing. May we ask uh, that the bench reconsider allowing civil party lawyers 15 minutes or 30 minutes uh, to make an uh, opening or make some statement. We know that the time is not very long. Uh, or commit uh, so much time of the court, but it is really important for the civil party and the victims uh, to have a say during this uh, opening statement session, the session they have been waiting for more than 30 procès, years. Please reconsider this. Thank you very much, Your Honours. The President. Merci. Le président. Thank you. Uh, with regard to the first uh, point, and due to time limitation. And indeed, and yesterday, there was temps, a technical glitch uh, with regard to the sound system. Avec les microphones. And that the co-prosecutors uh, had to make uh, their opening statement. And the chamber noted that le, uh, it was not yet uh, necessary to grant uh, such a permission for the recognition for the foreign lawyers. And we knew that voilà uh, we could really do this at a later uh, stage. A de de cette façon, et nous que la des and as uh, we already indicated, uh, they ultérieur. could be admit, uh, uh, recognized uh, at the end uh, of uh, this session. Être With regard uh, to the second uh, request uh, by the lead call lawyer asking orally to the chamber to grant uh, permission for the civil parties to make uh, the statement, this request was not different uh, from that uh, one that was put uh, before the chamber earlier. Uh, with regard to internal rule 89-2B, uh, which states that uh, the co-prosecutors uh, may make brief statement, Prévoie opening statement, de de la part about the charges against the accused person. Crime reproché aux accusés. This rule 89-B does not indicate the rights of the lead co-lawyers for the civil parties to make a such observation or statement. De prononcer de telles déclarations pour les Secondly, the chamber has already made it clearly On its document E131, dated on the 18th of November, November 2011, la on the scheduling order, clairement. and the Chamber notes very clearly that uh, the opening statement or observations by the lead call lawyers shall not be allowed or considered during the proceedings. Pour les principaux, pour les and according to another written notice, a request uh, by the civil party for uh, lawyers for the civil uh, the lawyers for the civil party. Les principaux. Document E one three one slash one. Slash one. four, or rather e one three one slash four slash one, bar one. Uh, which bar indicates bar uh, in our uh, 
ruling that uh, such a request uh, shall not uh, be granted. Indique le rejet de cette demande. The chamber, par la chambre. therefore, rejects la chambre the request rejette made donc by the la legal demande lawyer présentée par make le corps vocal principal de since it is now appropriate time for the lunch adjournment le moment est maintenant opportun de prendre la pause déjeuner we déjeuner. will take uh, the adjournment the session will be resumed by 1:30 13h30 parties to the proceeding and the public are advised to return to Nous the courtroom by that time so that we can proceed uh, with the remaining of the uh, session. The court uh, security personnel are now instructed to take uh, the accused back to the detention facility and bring them to the courtroom by that time.